All right, welcome back everybody. Let's look at an application of Euler's formula using integration. Okay, so let's recall some things. So one, let's recall Euler's formula. So that's e to the i theta. That's equal to cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. Let's also recall that e to the minus i theta, that's exactly the cosine of theta minus i sine of theta. And we're just gonna do a couple computations. So first, let's take the sum of the left side. That should be equal to the sum of the right side. And so I'm gonna say, let's just note. So let's note, call this A maybe. So the sum of the left side Well, that's gonna be equal to the sum of the right side. But if I take the sum of the right side, it looks like these will vanish and I'm gonna have two cosine of theta, right? So two cosine of theta, that means I could divide out the two. And so that gives me another expression for cosine of theta. We could actually do something similar just by taking the difference of each side. So the difference of the left side, that's gonna be E to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta. Now, if I take the difference of the right side, notice that the cosines will vanish, right? So this minus this is zero. And then if I do this minus this, note the, uh, the double negatives there. So I'll have two i sine of theta and I can divide out the two i. So that gives me the following. Okay. So keep these in mind. These are gonna give us some flexibility when we go ahead and integrate. It'd also be nice to note something we just proved. So we just proved for all natural numbers, n, e to the i n theta is equal to cosine of n theta plus i sine of n theta. Okay, so let's look at the following. So pretty neat application. So let's say, for example, we want to integrate the following. So let's say we've got cosine cubed of theta d theta. And so the thing we want to recall is that cosine of theta, well, that's equal to e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over two. So by substitution, this is exactly the integral of the quantity e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over two cubed. I also want to note the following. This will be helpful. So a plus b quantity cubed, that's exactly a cubed plus 3a squared b plus 3ab squared plus b cubed, right? From the binomial expansion. We have a proof of that in a previous video, so check that out. And let's see what we have here. Okay, so two cubed is eight, so that'll be one eighth. And then I'm just going to apply this right here carefully. So this will give me e to the i three theta or three i theta, that's fine as well. So that's sort of like this cubed. Plus three, well, you have to think about your exponent rules, right? So I want three. Well, if I do this squared, that's e to the 2i theta times e to the minus i theta, think about adding those exponents, you should end up with this. Okay, so sort of similarly, if I want to compute this, I should have this times this squared. Well, this squared is e to the minus 2i theta. And when I multiply the same bases, I add the exponents. So it looks like I'm going to get 3e to the minus i theta. So that seems fine. 
and then I want the last term cubed, but if I cube this, I should get exactly e to the minus three i theta. So now we get to be just a little clever and we wanna make some observations. And so keep in mind also, this is where we wanna use maybe um, uh, cosine of n theta is equal to e to the n i theta plus e to the minus n i theta over two. That'll be pretty helpful here and here. Uh, in this case, n is equal to three. So let's just note, if you multiply both sides by two, then two cosine of three theta. So again, I'm just plugging three in. So I noticed that these sort of match up with this, right? So again, just plugging three in for n, you realize that I really have this, right? So cosine of three theta, just move the two over multiply both sides by two. So that's gonna give me e to the three i theta plus e to the minus three i theta because n is three again. So that seems nice. I've got a nice replacement for those. So that's promising. And then also I wanna focus my attention here now. Okay, so let's think about it. We almost have this here, right? So if you think about this, multiplying both sides by two, Okay, so th where's the three coming from? So if I take this and maybe you can see it a bit clearer if I write it this way. So maybe if I, I deal with this and I write it in this way, it'll be even clearer. Well, that's the same thing as three times. Now, what is this equal to if I look here? Well, if I look here, this, should be exactly two cosine, right? If I isolate this, then I would have two cosine. So that seems really nice. So that means that these terms are six cosine of theta. And these terms are two cosine of three theta. And that's pretty easy to integrate in respect to theta. Okay, so what do we have here? So I have one eighth. And so this will be two times one third sine of three theta. When I integrate, I take the antiderivative, right? And then here, this should be six sine, right? Because the antiderivative of cosine is sine plus C. And then maybe I'll just distribute the eight and then reduce. So that'll be a quarter times a third. So that's a 12th. That's sine of three theta plus, well, six eighths is three fourths. Plus C. So pretty neat. Pretty neat way to use this stuff. And so you can imagine if the powers get sufficiently high, this, this, depending on how comfortable you are with the binomial theorem, this could be a neat way to tackle high powers of trig functions. Okay, so let's look at another application of Euler's formula. Maybe something that's a bit unexpected. Now, typically you run across a problem like this in calculus two, when you're talking about integration by parts and very often you use a technique called solving algebraically for the integral to, to solve this. But we're gonna try this with Euler's formula. And there's a bunch of different variations we could look at. We could adjust these. We could put coefficients in front, but I just want to get the idea across here. So let's recall a couple things. 
So remember if I have a complex number that's an A plus BI form, then when I say the real part of this, I'm talking about A. When I talk about the imaginary part of this, I specifically mean B. So for example, if I had um, the following, so think of Euler's formula. So the real part of E to the IX, well, E to the IX is cosine of X plus I sine of X. So the real part would be cosine of X. And if I talk about the imaginary part of this, that should be the sine of X. Okay, if that's not clear, just expand this out using Euler's formula and just think about what the real part goes with and what the imaginary part goes with. Okay, so that seems interesting. So how can I apply that here? Well, cosine is exactly the real part of e to the ix, right? The real part of e to the ix is cosine. Okay, so that's interesting. So another way to refer to this is the real part of e to the ix. Okay, we can do a little algebra here. So this is e to the x plus ix dx. And that reminds us of a substitution. So let's let u equal x plus ix. The derivative is one plus i dx. And so that's one over one plus i du is equal to dx. Okay, so this is the substitution we wanna make. So we wanna be careful because we wanna apply this sort of real operator at the very, very end. So I'm gonna just sort of push this to the side and really, again, I don't compute this to the very, very end. So what do I have? I have one over one plus I, the integral of E to the U du. Well, that's not too bad because we know the antiderivative of e to the u is itself. Okay, so we want to sort of deal with this a bit more. So there's two things I want to deal with. What is e to the u? Well, it's e to this power. And then I want to multiply this by the conjugate. Okay, so I'm going to multiply this by 1 minus i over 1 minus i. And then e to the u is e to the x plus ix. And so we've got a little bit of work to do here. Okay, so what happens here? Okay, so when we multiply complex conjugates, we get the uh, first thing squared plus the coefficient of i squared. So that's gonna give us a two. So you can multiply that out if you wanna see that directly. And the numerator will be one minus i. And then this right here, I can call this e to the x, e to the i x. And then we can use Euler's formula here. So I want the real part of one minus i over two. This is e to the x times, well, by Euler's formula, that's cosine of x plus i sine of x plus c. And I'm not too worried about this. Um, maybe it'd be nice to distribute the one minus i. Okay, so by the commutative property of multiplication, maybe I'll bring these together. Not too worried about that. But I do wanna multiply one minus i times this. 
because again, I want to simplify things as much as possible and then at the end carefully take the real part. So exactly as you'd imagine, we're just going to multiply through and just be careful that i times i is i squared, which is minus 1. Okay, so one times anything, that means I should get a copy of, so how do I want to write this? How about cosine of x plus i sine of x? And then carefully with the minus i, so that'll be minus i cosine of x. i times i is minus 1, but that's already minus, so it looks like plus sine of x plus c. And let's see what we have here. So what's left over. So now let's go ahead and take the real part. Well, the real part of this is itself. Uh, the real part of this is itself. Well, I don't want this because that's imaginary. That's imaginary. That's real. And I want the real part of this. Let's call it plus some plus k. Okay. This might be a complex number. And if I take the real part, I just want k is some real number. So really, really cool application of Euler's formula, right? Really cool. It turned that integration by parts where you had to solve for the integral into a basic u sub. Very nice.